Hello, everyone. Hi there, and we hope you're having a lovely Wednesday afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, for those who don't know me. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Megan Bever. Welcome, Megan. Thanks for having me. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Megan's latest book, At War with King Alcohol, Debating, Drinking, and Masculinity in the Civil War. Um, so that promises to be a, a fun conversation. I don't know if anyone's on their, their lunch break and uh, can raise a glass of your favorite beverage. Uh, please join us. Uh, I'm sticking with water today, but uh, we are talking. I don't know if any folks are local to the Frederick area, but myself and a colleague are going to be at uh, one of the local uh, drinking establishments here in Frederick, a place called Frederick Social. Um, so, and we're going to be talking about alcohol in the Civil War, among other things. So, I'm looking forward to picking up some good stories and tidbits and such to use in in uh, my presentation this very evening. Um, so anyway, wherever you're watching us from, um, it's great, of course, to hear where you're tuning in from. I see we've got uh, Suzanne from New Orleans tuning in, uh, John from Lakeland, Florida. It's great to see some familiar names and such pop up. Um, if you enjoy this program or any of our other programs, uh, consider hitting the like button and definitely hit the share button. It's a great, easy, free way to support the museum uh, and the best way to stay up to date with all of our video programming and events and things that we have going on is make sure you like us across all of our social uh, social medias. We're on Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and recently TikTok. So you can follow us uh, wherever you get your social medias and uh, you, can, you can find us there. So, uh, and if you wanna take your support to the next level, um, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. For as low as $25 a year, you not only support great video programming like this, uh, but you get free admission to our three locations, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, uh, and then the Pry House Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield, which is regrettably closed for the season, but we're going to reopen in the springtime. Uh, and then the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in downtown Washington, D.C., which after a extended closure. Uh, we're now reopen regular hours, Fridays and Saturdays. Ah, and I see you got a missing soldier's office mug. Excellent, Megan. Love to see that. Um, so definitely uh, come check us out. We're open uh, now Fridays and Saturdays consistently. So uh, that we would love to, to have you come pay us a visit. So anyway, uh, if you sign up for a membership, you'll get free admission to all of those locations for a year and you support great programming like this. So with all that said, uh, oh, and I'll note finally before we jump in, if anyone has questions uh, for us as the program goes on, drop them in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so with all that said, Megan, I wonder if maybe you could uh, introduce yourself to our audience, tell folks a bit about yourself, how you came to Civil War history, and then of course, how you came to writing um, the book in question, At War with King Alcohol. Sure. Um, thank you. It's really great to be here today. I'm I'm really excited about this. Um, so as you said, my name is Megan Bever. I am an associate professor of history and chair of social sciences at Missouri Southern State University. It is a, a public institution, um, mid-sized, um, and it is in Joplin, Missouri. So we're down in the southwest corner of Missouri, um, just a few miles from Kansas and Oklahoma and a little bit north. Um, of Arkansas. So I'm pretty I'm well across the Mississippi River, um, I guess you could you could say. So I um, have been a Civil War historian, uh, I guess, probably in some ways for a long time. Um, I, I've been interested in the war since I was a pretty young kid. Um, maybe first or second grade. It started with some family vacations to Lincoln's house in Springfield and Gettysburg and Spotsylvania and all those um, kind of classic places. Um, and then I uh, majored in history as an undergraduate, wasn't necessarily totally interested in the Civil War, um, but kind of came back to it by the time I uh, went to graduate school at the University of Alabama. Um, and so 
once I, I got into my graduate studies, um, I became really interested in reform, um, really interested in anxieties that cause people to be worried about drinking um, and worried about sin and those kinds of things. Um, I'm sure the fact that I was raised Baptist um, and my grandpa was a Baptist preacher may have had something to do with, with um, my interest in that. Um, uh, but I had my, a great... My, my grandfather was also a Baptist preacher, yeah, so it, we, it's like... something we have in common. It sticks with you in some ways. Um, so uh, um, I, I worked with uh, George Rabel when I was at Alabama, and he was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful advisor. Um, and I thought my interests were really taking me in different ways. Um, and he was able to point out to me that they really weren't, um, that there was a lot of really good material where liquor and reform and drinking um, intersected with the war. Um, and he pointed out that it was everywhere, but no one had done a study on it. Um, and he really thought that the digital age, the, the ability to keyword search to find liquor in places maybe that it hadn't been easily found before in the primary sources um, would be beneficial. Um, so it was really a combination of my interests and his guidance that led me first to this as a dissertation topic and then to a book project. God bless uh, those advisors that push us yeah. in the just the direction we need to go. Uh, yes. And we were, we were talking a little bit beforehand. I mean, it's it's amazing how book projects can really kind of sneak up on you in ways that you're you're never quite prepared for. Which uh, you know, honestly, is probably a hallmark of uh, or a sign that you're going in the right direction. If uh, it, you you you're almost caught unprepared by a topic you land on. Yes, so, uh, I love that. Um, so I, I I also always like to ask uh, authors this question: uh, What sort of sources did you consult for this book? And and I'm intrigued, especially too, by what you just said about how you're, you know, using keyword searches and digital things. Like, where where were you looking for things like that? And then finally, were there any sources that surprised you at just how useful they were? Yeah. So I started with um, the Journal of the American Temperance Union. Um, which I actually looked at on microfilm, and then it was subsequently digitized. So you can find it all on Google Books now. Um, but it is full of really rich material about what it ran all the way through the war. Um, so it was really interesting to see the reform community and the way that they flip framed the conflict. Um, I use a lot of soldiers' accounts to see what they're drinking and how they feel about it. Those are, are really helpful. Um, I use the official records they're, you know, just chock full of stuff. Um, government records, of course, uh, medical records from the Union and the Confederacy. And then um, one of, there are a couple of, of sources I stumbled upon that I, I, they turned out to be really rich. One was um, a set of dispensary records in the Mississippi State Archives. Um, they established dispensaries during the war, and that's how they distributed alcohol. Um, they did it through a prescription system, um, and it predates other state dispensary systems. Um, but those records, they're there and they're cataloged, but I don't think they've been used very much. Um, and I found them absolutely fascinating. Um, and then the other thing is I went to NARA um, when I was uh, revising the manuscript for the book because I wanted to add provost marshal records. Um, and while I was there getting provost marshal records, I decided to delve into supply records and just see what was there. Um, and in the process, I found a lot of Confederate medical purveyor records um, and a lot of, of um, commissary records and supply records for the Union Army, um, where I was able to track uh, whiskey, you know, at times down to the ounce, um, and just kind of see where it's moving and where it's flowing. Um, I I don't think, if you'd have told me in grad school, I was going to get really, really excited about commissary tables. I, I don't think I would have believed you, but that's where I ended up very happily um, a few afternoons um, in in the National Archives. <laughs> That's great, uh, and and thank you for that clarification. I was going to say for folks that that don't know, NARA is uh, sort of an abbreviation for the National Archives. Um, and and another great thing worth highlighting. Sometimes you never quite know what you're going to find. I mean, you mentioned how you were looking, you know, kind of on a whim. 
looking into like medical or uh, not even medical, but like supply records. And suddenly there's Confederate medical purveyors things in there. I mean, like especially Confederate sources, um, you know, they either many, of course, destroyed, um, yeah. but they get kind of scattered to the wind um, in almost a very literal way. Um, and and yeah. they can just turn up in these weird places that you'd never quite expect. And I mean, I'm not saying to the point that people should go around just pulling random collections, um, right. ex expecting to find, you know, Confederate records of some form or another, but you honestly never do quite know. And that's a great example of that. Right. So I, I, I love hearing uh, stories like that. Uh, now, of course, when talking about, uh, you know, alcohol in the Civil War era, um, we can't go very far without talking about the temperance movement. And, you know, of course, we shouldn't. Um, so I think maybe towards the beginning here is a, a good way to kind of maybe get some background for our audience about, mm -hmm. you know, alcohol coming up to the Civil War. And then, you know, so explain a bit about what the temperance movement was and how people generally thought about alcohol, both in the military and out the military. So, so tell us the story up to the Civil War, basically. Okay. Um, it's kind of a long story, but um, so there has been, or there had been in the early 19th century, um, a temperance movement in the United States. So by temperance, we mean people um, who oppose um, drinking, they had kind of evolved um, over the first few decades of the 19th century. Um, after really 1826 and, and really by the 1830s, temperance reformers um, in the United States typically were, were in support of teetotaling. So they were kind of of the mindset that um, one drop was a drop too many and could eventually lead to your ruin. Um, and they had, I mean, I think they had some justification for thinking this. Um, Americans drank quite a bit, um, in part because, I mean, you really didn't necessarily want to drink the water. Um, but a lot of people were drunk. There were a lot of problems with drunken men beating and abandoning their wives. So the temperance reformers aren't just making this up. Um, it really was a social concern. They really were concerned about families. They might have gone, they were also hyperbolic. But I think the concern at, at, the, at the bottom was real. So the first thing that the movement tries to do, and, and it's really popular in northern cities, it's not as, there aren't as many cities in the south, so it's it's more of a northern phenomenon. Um, they first try what they call moral suasion, this idea that you can convince people to better themselves individually, you can make a moral argument that makes them uh, give up drinking, sign a pledge, um, and and turn to cold water. By the 1850s, that really isn't working. So they're turning to what they call, and really by the 1840s, they're turning to legal suasion, which means use the use state and local governments to uh, try to coerce people to stop drinking. Um, so one form of this would be regulation where you just require licenses and you restrict how much people can sell. Temperance reformers want prohibition. Um, and in the early 1850s, they get a uh, statewide prohibition in a number of states. The first state to pass it is Maine. So these prohibition laws become known as Maine laws, um, where you have states trying to restrict uh, this, the sale of alcohol. Um, in the 1850s, it doesn't go very well. Um, those laws are usually struck down by the courts. They're really unenforceable. Um, especially because they're at the state level, so people can cross state lines um, and get what they want, things like that. So when the war starts, I would say temperance reformers, especially in the North, are very frustrated. Um, they don't like regulation. They believe that the that state um, governments are condoning sin by regulating it. Um, they are upset about slavery. They think it is distracting people from a bigger problem um, the, the, that is drunkenness. Um, so that's where the temperance movement is in the North. And then in the South, um, again, it's much smaller because the South is more rural. Um, there are different camps of historians. Some people, some historians say that Southerners don't like temperance because they associate it with abolition. Um, and then you have other scholars who say it's really, it's as much or, or more that Southerners are more rural and that distilling is a part of, of farm life. 
Um, and so you do see temperance movements where there, I mean, where there's a middle class in the South, there just aren't as many places for it to, for it to pop up. Um, and I would also argue that you have prohibition anywhere you have slavery and black codes that um, prohibit um, black people from, from drinking. That's where you see prohibition. Um, so it exists in the South. It just looks quite a bit different. Um, so that's where it's at on the eve of, of the war. Very interesting. Um, yeah, that, that kind of dichotomy a bit between North and South and how they both kind of approached um, the movement a bit differently. Uh, now, how does this, um, or, or perhaps it doesn't, uh, relate with kind of military culture of the time? Um, oh, right. We can, we can, well, we can start with before the war, and I'd be curious, even, even during the war, kind of how the temperance movement uh, evolves in relation with, uh, with the military. Right. I forgot that part. Sorry. Um, so the military is not, um, they are not on the same page as temperance reformers. So for a temperance reformer, your ideal, and, and I'll talk specifically about men, um, the ideal man from a temperance reformer's perspective is a man who is completely self-controlled, very temperate in a lot of habits, but doesn't drink, also probably doesn't gamble, you know, is saving money, those sorts of things. Um, the U.S. military is not in that tradition. Um, they are... Um, drinking is a part of army culture before the war, particularly for officers. Um, it's a privilege that comes with rank. So enlisted men are expected to be sober, but officers are allowed to keep liquor in their private stores. And this continues through the war. So um, enlisted men are only supposed to drink when they've been given specific permission um, in the form of a ration. Um, and, and those are, are issued for different reasons, for health um, and for fatigue duty, those sorts of things. Um, but then officers are allowed to drink. Um, and so this puts the military at odds with the temperance movement even before the war. And in fact, the temperance movement um, has kind of had its hands in the Navy. There's a lot of Navy reform that happens um, in the antebellum decades, they're trying to make it less draconian, get re getting rid of flogging, those sorts of things. So the rum ration in the Navy has already come under fire. Um, and at times the military, their spirit rations have come under fire from temperance reformers too. So the availability of those rations kind of ebbed and flowed um, through the pre-war decades. Um, but I would say the military very much starts the war um, not wanting drunkenness, but also considering it a privilege of rank and also considering it a part of um, the health. It, they need the, the spirit rations for the health of the armies. Yeah, and so this is interesting. So, you know, there is, you know, maybe not a majority of society, but a notable percentage of society that is, you know, pretty anti-alcohol with the temperance movement. Um, you know, it's that's moving in one direction, and the army, you know, just as a as an entity, is generally fairly pro-alcohol. And you know, peacetime, they're sort of working casually across purposes, but they're in some ways kind of in different lanes of society. And then the civil war comes, and suddenly everyone's in the army. Uh, and right. there's this sort of latent culture that was kind of bubbling over here with the army. And then suddenly it's all kind of the same thing. And I could see how this could lead to some sort of explosive um, collision, I guess, which I, I think you probably talk about. So maybe now's a good time to talk about what that looked like. Yeah. Um, I think explosive collision is a is a good way of thinking about it. Um, and it's hard to know where to start. So you have men who come into the army from all different backgrounds. Um, some of them have been from evangelical or middle-class families. So they're they're from that temperance backgrounds, but plenty other soldiers are from, um, they're from rural backgrounds where temperance hasn't really been a part of their lives or they're from, you know, working class or maybe German or Irish backgrounds. Um, so I think you get that clash from soldiers themselves um, where they're bringing different values and different ideas about drinking into the military where drinking is a pretty standard part of the culture. And then in addition to the men who are enlisting and joining, you also have temperance reformers and their parents back on the home front 
freaking out about all of these young men going away to camps where they're going to be away from church, away from their parents, away from their wives with all sorts of temptation. So um, I really see the men finding a middle ground um, where for a lot of them, complete abstinence from alcohol isn't practical, right? This sober masculinity that temperance reformers and other civilians can espouse, it doesn't work because you need the spirit rations for health. Um, you also, a lot of soldiers drink because their mental health is really uh, stressed during the war. Um, and it's just, again, for a million reasons, it's not practical to be completely sober. So that form of masculinity doesn't really work for soldiers, but they also get really mad, really angry when people drink to excess. So enlisted men critique officers who are drunken, who they think abuse them or waste effort or, you know, wasting manpower. Um, that's especially, I think Confederate soldiers especially get frustrated. Um, they know that manpower is limited and they can't stand the idea that somebody might be, be wasting their bodies um, or their efforts. Um, so I find, I think they find a middle ground that's not quite the old military culture, but it's definitely not civilian culture. Um, this masculinity where you can drink pragmatically when you need to, but if you go over the top um, and drink to excess where you're hurting other soldiers, that really becomes a problem. Sure, and that that makes all kinds of sense. Um, definitely, you know, kind of this, like you said, kind of a common sense middle ground of sorts. Yeah. So. I, there's a lot of different directions we can go from here now that we've kind of, I think we've done a reasonably good job of broad brush strokes, kind of sketching what the landscape looks like. Um, I actually want to start with the, the subtitle of your book, because yeah. I think, um, you know, debating drinking and masculinity in the Civil War, and we're going to get to a lot of the drinking and masculinity parts in just a moment, because that, that's obviously a key part of, you know, your argument and such. Um, but I wonder if you might talk a bit about the word debating in there. You don't see the word debating in a lot of people's, uh, you know, subtitles. So I'm curious, um, you know, where the, and I know sometimes titles and subtitles are out of the author's control too, so that, that could be at play here. But, um, you know, who are you debating with? What do you, and where do you land on the debate? And what's the debate about? And you know, you don't have to give away all of your your big points in the book because uh, we still want people to go out there and get it wherever fine books are sold. Um, but yeah, I'd be just curious if you could talk a little bit about the debating aspect of it. Yeah. So I was actually when I I, I worked with the press to come up with that subtitle. Um, and I wanted the word debating in there because I feel, and I was actually thinking of my sources. Um, I feel like I feel like I cannot argue that Americans are of one mind. And it's not even as simple as saying Confederates are of, of one mind and and unionists are of another. There's this debate and it's constantly going back and forth. And it's between civilians and the military, it's between enlisted men and their officers. It's and people sometimes even switch sides. So I feel like the debate is constant. It's how much can I drink and still be a good American in this war? Like that's the the question I think that everyone is asking. And how much can my neighbor drink and still be a good American? Maybe that's maybe that's the question. Well, that uh, and perhaps the answers to those questions are not the same. <laughs> No, I, no, they're not. And so that's where I, I felt like everything was was being pulled. Um, just with drinking, but also with masculinity, that we have all these competing definitions um, and and they're clashing with each other. So these debates are happening on the ground and they're happening constantly. So I was thinking actually of my subject matter with, with the term debate, but it works historiographically too, because I think one of uh, kind of a big question that Civil War historians have is what is going on with masculinity during the war? And, you know, you have some people like Peter Carmichael um, who see 
differences between uh, Union soldiers and and Confederate soldiers and how they conceive of masculinity. Um, you know, Lori and Foote has done some really good or good work on this too. She's looking at enlisted men and their conceptions of masculinity. So um, those debates are going on in the historiography, people trying to figure out how are we defining manhood in this war? Um, and I enter that debate and I don't feel like I make good conclusions. I, I feel like my my study says, yeah, it is it is pretty messy, um, which is maybe not that satisfying. Um, but I, I, I don't see the same lines. I, I think I see currents running across both regions. I see currents running in different directions um, than some other historians. So I don't know if I come down on a side. Um, yeah, well, so it, I'll tell you what your answer makes me feel good about. You make me feel really good about the statement I made earlier about how when the Civil War breaks out, there's kind of an explosive collision yeah. um, because that's that's kind of exactly what you're what you're getting at. And and you're you're so right to say that not everyone, not all Americans, even just northern and southern Americans are, are all of one mind, which when you say it out loud almost sounds obvious, but right. we, we like to think that way. Um, because right. I think humans tend to like to categorize things just as a generality. So, I mean, I, I get it to some degree, but, and, you know, it might not be sexy uh, to, to say, well, you know what, things are just a bit messy, but, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of truth to that, certainly in wartime. Absolutely. So I, I, I like that a lot. And I'm also proud to note that uh, we've had both uh, Peter Carmichael and Laurie and Foote on uh, previous installments of this. So uh, people can go back and check those out Good. if you want to want to hear them talk. Uh, those two talk more at length about their uh, their subject matters. So, um, yeah, that that's so interesting. And it, it didn't even occur to me that that uh, word might work on two levels. You're yeah. focusing on both the historiographic debate, like you were just talking about, but also on the debate of the subject matter, because, you know, for however much historians like to debate about the past, people that lived in the past like to debate amongst themselves quite a bit, too. So <laughs> absolutely that that works. Um, so let's then shift to the the latter part of the uh, the your, your subtitle there. Um, but uh, let's start with the drinking. And, and obviously, um, I think when we talk about cer certainly the way that this book is framed at war with King Alcohol, you know, this kind of conflict over over alcohol, I think a lot of people's minds tend to focus on, well, I mean, alcohol is obviously a bad influence on people. And, you know, there's certainly truth to that. No, no question. Um, but given that we are a medical museum, I I'd like to maybe just start by talking a little bit about um, the medical uses of alcohol and other kind of positive and or practical uses that alcohol was put to during the war in the military. Yeah, so one of the things I, I think, and I try to do this with the title, um, I think you're right. We see at war with King Alcohol, we think that alcohol is the enemy and we're at war with it. But I think that, that with functions multiple ways um, because alcohol is very much a part of both um, Union and Confederate uh, military medical cultures. Um, and both, I would say both uh, Union and Confederate armies use liquor the same way or use alcohol the same way. They tend to call it liquor. Um, they're using it, I think its uses are rooted in medicine. This idea, um, it's the 19th century idea that alcohol, alcohol is a stimulant. Um, so you drink it and it gives the body, I guess, a, a jolt, if you will. Um, and it can help treat a variety of illnesses and it can also treat wounds, although you've got to be careful. Um, so the, the medical manuals talk, you, you want to give some liquor, but you don't want to give too much liquor, especially with head wounds, because um, you don't want to overstimulate and, and, um, and uh, Hammond uh, in the North, he's especially worried. He is worried about the effects of too much alcohol. Um, but he can't give it up completely. Um, so you use it in those two ways. They use it, they're mixing it with quinine as a prophylactic against malaria. Um, they're still kind of feeling their way through that, but they're trying to cut the quinine with, with whiskey. Um, and then it kind of evolves from there. So you have the medical rations, and then um, they're also giving rations in cases of exposure to the elements, and then in cases of fatigue duty. 
Um, and those definitions really have a lot uh, of ability to be broadened. Um, and the decision about whether you distribute rations gets passed down the chain of command. Um, so you have, in some cases, you know, uh, regimental commanders or even kind of company officers deciding um, when they've been exposed enough to, to get liquor. So the official uses are this, the same sort of, although there's a lot of fluidity about when they're distributed, the supply is very different. So the Union armies are much better supplied with, uh, with whiskey and liquor than their Confederate counterparts. Confederates have pretty chronic shortages. Um, so you see the Confederacy actually desperate, on the one hand, desperate to keep soldiers from getting drunk, but more desperate to manufacture enough liquor that they can use in their hospitals um, because they're they're chronically short. Um, so on the ground, the use looks, looks different because of supply, but but in the 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 manuals, it looks very similar. Gotcha. That that makes sense. And and to the question about supply, um, large hospitals like Chimborazo, and, and Chimborazo is not unique in this. Uh, in this regard, but uh, large hospitals would have large breweries on the premises to have a, a consistent supply of at least beer um, just right there. Um, so there's that. And then one other thing worth noting, um, something they're not using alcohol for from a me medical perspective is to, you know, sterilize anything nope. or, you know, no, none of that, uh, no, no germ theory at the time of the nope. Civil War. They don't have any idea about this, uh, you know, that aspect uh, of alcohol. Right. Um, Another then, oh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. Another thing I found surprising, I think I expected them to be using it for pain killing. And they that doesn't seem to be it. Obviously, they recognize it. The soldiers know that it has numbing effects because they're using it for that. Um, but there's no like if we give someone a shot, it'll take the edge off. Maybe that's what they mean by stimulating, you know, like you, you get a little jolt and then it doesn't bother you as much. Um but nothing about, you know, like, yeah, numbing of, yeah, that that's not really playing into it. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, a common myth regarding Civil War medicine is, oh, well, they didn't have anesthesia. They must have just used some whiskey. Um, yeah, no. de definitely not the case. Um, and, they, and they did have anesthesia. As right. Faithful viewers of, of our videos will know. And of course, we're honor bound to say 95% of Civil War surgery used anesthesia. So there you right. go. If you haven't heard it here, or you've heard it a thousand times. <laughs> um, so there, there's that. But yes, just those two quick points of things that they're not using alcohol for, which it, it may be surprising to some to some people. Um, so uh, and and maybe we're going to get into this in some of the next questions. But uh, Barbara. Uh, says, you know, did many soldiers feel like I could die tomorrow, so I may as well drink today? Definitely. And in fact, I think I have, there's one instance where somebody pretty much says that, um, that he's an officer, but his soldiers are in New Orleans. And he basically says, I'm going to let them drink because we're in the city and they can. And we're kind of living by the, you know, be merry, you know, you know, be merry today, drink and be merry because tomorrow we could die. Um, so yeah, they're um in some cases just very specific about that being why they're drinking. Um, and in other cases, it's pretty clear that it's homesickness and just the constant pressure um and fear that they're dealing with. Sure. Um uh, another interesting question from Richard here. Uh was there any pushback in using it? in using alcohol at all from officers or men who were average temperance men before the, the war. So were there like te temperance, you know, quote unquote plants, um, you know, in the army and, and, and what did that look like? Or, and and yeah. perhaps, perhaps did the war convert some of these temperance people, you know, away from the temperance movement at all? But what was that relationship like? Yeah, I don't know that the war converts anyone. And then, and temperance reformers, North, this is North and South, they are actually sending tracks like begging soldiers not to to drink medicinally um and and saying things like like your parents would rather you die of typhoid than drink liquor and i i feel like maybe they didn't consult with parents or maybe 19th century parents are different i don't really know um but then there are 
most of the examples I can think of are men who choose for themselves that they're not going to do it. Um, and they're like um, McDowell. Um, Irvin McDowell is a teetotaler and really uh, stubborn um, and, and proud of himself for not using medicinal liquor. He gets accused of being drunk anyway, so it doesn't do him any good. Um, so you have people who were, will, who will forego it or will throw out their liquor rations when they're given them. Um, so I see it more on, like on that individual level where people, um, are just refusing it themselves. Um, but you also see in hospital newspapers, these requests that maybe soldiers shouldn't be drinking the medicinal whiskey when it's offered, um, that it's a bad idea. So yeah, kind of a mix of temperance reformers sending materials in and then people kind of pushing back against it when they're offered it. Gotcha. Now, obviously you've kind of alluded to this fact uh, a, a handful of times already, but you know, the alcohol is sort of in many ways pervasive uh, through the armies, but um, you, you shouldn't get too drunk. Um, you know, there, there are limits even amongst the, the hardest hardline people, you know, in the military about the, the advocates of alcohol. Um, what sort of penalties uh, for drunkenness were there? Because if you were an alcoholic, uh, I believe you, you weren't even allowed to enlist in the army. But if you were drunk in the army, you, you know, you really couldn't or wouldn't be discharged for that sort of thing. So talk about that dynamic a little bit. Yeah, um, the punishments, they kind of run the gamut. And I think um, I think the armies do more punishing after the, well, that's not fair. Sometimes it feels like they do more punishing after the fact and not enough prevention. But I think both of those things are constantly in play that they're trying to prevent because punishing after the fact is ineffective. Um, but it's it's a range of corporal punishments. Um, I think especially for enlisted men, um, just some of it is, I don't wanna say it's, I don't mean that it's comical, um, but just almost like cartoonish, I think is, you know, the riding the barrel, the wearing the sign that says drunkard on, you know, part of, on, on your, the placards. Um, those sorts of things. Some commanders were absolutely cruel, um, holding people up by their thumbs, leaving them out naked in the cold, like just horrible, horrible punishments. Um, and then it finds imprisonment. And that usually comes when something else, like the drunkenness causes somebody to do something else. So you've got drunkenness and some other charge. Um, I think the punishments get more severe, but definitely corporal punishment um, and there's some cases even settlers um, get uh, corporal punishments. Um, there are two settlers who are selling, uh, so camp merchants, um, selling liquor illegally, um, and they get uh, whipped and then put in a canoe on the Potomac without paddles. Um, I, have no, I have no idea what happens to them. Um, but uh, um, so yeah, very military, kind of old-fashioned in that way, um, and it backfires. Um, what tends to happen is that enlisted men uh, have sympathy for the guys being punished for being drunk um, in those cases, especially when it seems really petty or cruel. Um, so it's, I don't find that it's effective, um, but, yeah, but they are, yeah, it's the, the, military corporal punishments. Yeah, in some ways, uh, hearing you say that, I could see how that could be kind of a tough middle ground to strike because you obviously, you know, if, if something is unacceptable, you don't want to be overly harsh and generate sympathy for the person, but you don't want to do nothing and sort of right. tacitly allow the behavior. So it's, I could see how that would be kind of a tough needle to thread. Right. But um, they are, but I think what's interesting is that they are tacitly allowing it, right? Sure. By, by, letting the decisions go down the chain of command by allowing it for exhaustion and for so these men i think this is part of what makes them angry is their commanding officer one day could say it's raining have a drink and then two days later you decide you're cold and so you're also going to have a drink and next thing you know you're in trouble and it's like well which which is it you know it, the 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 distinction there is pretty murky 
I see. So it's it's the double standard that's so yeah. aggravating for the soldiers. Absolutely. Which, you know, uh, all double standards, of course, are aggravating. Right. Um, so yeah, that that makes total sense. Um, quickly popping over to the comments, uh, a couple things. Um, Rich, as per something we were talking about earlier, uh, Rich says, so the stereotypical Civil War movie scene of the soldier given whiskey before amputation is not accurate. No, uh, unequivocally, no. Yeah. And uh, John Willen comments, John Willen, a friend member of the museum, uh, provides this handy st statistic of uh, the Union Medical Department used 1.9 million 32 ounce bottles of alcohol uh, during the war, which is uh, a pretty staggering amount kind of, yeah. a, as you were saying earlier, I mean, the, the quantities we're talking about are, and, and this is just the Union Medical Department, these aren't soldiers, right. uh, you know, drinking. So the, the quantities are just uh, off the chain. Um, and then, uh, a question from Karen um, that is probably outside the purview of your study, but I'd be curious just for your comments on this. Um, she says, did the introduction to drinking for some men during the Civil War uh, lead to high rates of alcoholism after the war? So that's a really good question. And I don't have, you know, I don't have the numbers. I can't like say, yes, so-and-so started drinking during the war. He kept it. But Yes. I think my answer, just my gut answer is yes. Um, I think, and, and this gets into to studies by like Jim Martin, who, who studies veterans a lot. Um, he sees these very same type of patterns in veterans houses or like in veterans homes. Um, this I, So basically this idea of like, I need to drink because I'm in pain all the time or I'm coping with, I mean, they wouldn't have called it PTSD, but the, kind of seems very similar to that um that you see men basically allowing themselves to drink for their health as they define it um and not consider themselves any less uh, um manly or masculine so i think that the patterns that we see in the war absolutely follow veterans into the post-war which certainly would make sense because they're the same person you right. know as, as the war i mean obviously they've undergone you know life-changing situations obviously but but they are the same human beings so that makes total sense that right. you know that's going to follow somebody home uh, but yeah it's it's a, a really good question and uh yeah glad we got a chance to tackle that and then uh one more question from the comments um rich asks uh were there differences in alcohol policy slash use in different ethnic groups in the army, uh, such as the Irish Brigade, or, um, and this is now speaking for myself, uh, I believe I saw a, a cartoon in Harper's Weekly um, where like there, there was a German unit that had like a, a wagon that came around, there's just kegs of beer yeah. that permanently travels with the unit. So I wonder if maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, so the, the regulations, they actually vary regiment to regiment across, again, because it's so, dis, like, it's disseminated, the decisions. But yeah, German regiments especially um, get to have a beer ration that other units don't get. And it causes kind of, I think, jealousy and, and sometimes fury um, from uh, regiments that are full of native-born soldiers. And Christian Keller gets into some of this as well with with some of his Germans at Chancellorsville study. Um, but yeah, German regiments absolutely um, get get more uh, beer rations. And I think the the understanding is basically that German soldiers drink differently than American soldiers. Um, and the beer is just kind of part of life. Um, and they do use it more steadily and more regularly. Um, and then uh, Irish regiments are more likely to have reputations for drinking, reputations for raucous uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrations. Um, I don't, it's hard to know if it's actually true that they're being more raucous. It doesn't seem from the, um, from the actual sources, it doesn't seem like it, um, but that's the reputation that they have. Um, but yeah, the German regiments are the main ones I can think of where um, the the beer rations are constant. Gotcha. Um, now, a, a big part of your book that we haven't focused as much on um, that I think we definitely should, um, as we're kind of on the back half of the program here, um, 
how do morality, masculinity, and disloyalty fit into this conversation? Because at least for me, um, it's not an obvious connection, um, and and I think it's quite clever. Um, so I wondered if you if you talk about that and maybe you know kind of what drew your attention to that in the first place. Yeah. So this is where I think the Confederacy comes in, and their behavior. Um, is really, really, really interesting to me. So if you have before the war, as I was saying earlier, Southern white Southerners are not known for being temperance reformers. But during the war, really by 1862, you have seven Confederate states that are that have passed prohibition. Um, and they do this uh, for kind of practical reasons because they have grain shortages um, and they don't want farmers distilling uh, grains and and fruits because they think that base they, they basically make the charge that people who are distilling are taking bread and food away from women and children, soldiers' wives, um, and families, and they're doing it to make profit. That there is this ability for them to profit from the war by distilling. So you start with these really practical prohibitions, and then it becomes a slippery slope where distillers and drunkards then become people who are threatening the Confederate nation. They're undercutting it. They are speculating. They might be extortionists. And they get conflated with deserters. Um, and um, ultimately, like there are charges of disloyalty. Basically, distillers are people who are actively working against the state. And what's interesting is then you start to see interplay. So in places where there's social unrest anyway and political unrest, um, like North Carolina, um, if you look at uh, the letters people are writing to Zeb Vance, the governor, you see a lot of overlap between the areas where there's a lot of disloyalty and where there are a lot of uh, charges of distilling. So my disloyal neighbors are also distilling. Um, or you see, um, I'm looking at some cases in Missouri right now where people are trying to figure out if whiskey sellers are selling illegally and their loyalty is a part of this. Basically, it's like, I think that so-and-so is selling illegally. He's also disloyal. So it makes sense that he would be selling or other people like, no, he's not selling. He's not breaking laws. He's a loyal citizen. So um, basically the character of the person who's selling gets then conflated or, or connected to, I should say, the fate of the nation. And you see it most acutely in the Confederacy because, I mean, arguably their position is more volatile, but you also see it in the border states, I think. So that's where, um, and the masculinity is folded in there, right? The the distillers and the drunkards are not good patriotic men. Um, in fact, they're disloyal. So that's where the ma masculinity is folded in there as well. Yeah, what a fascinating conflation. I've, I've certainly never heard about that before. Um, and it's interesting. Well, I mean, and, you know, you talked about the the grain shortage is, a, you know, a big part of the reason why this was. But, you know, there, there's prohibition in, in the southern states and, and, you know, where the temperance movement was not as strong be before the war, um, which is so fascinating, it, almost kind of in similar ways that, you know, the Confederacy, you know, uh, who touts the whole limited national government thing first institutes the draft and yeah um it's 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 all very fascinating and uh yeah what what an interesting kind of correlation that you picked up on um as like you know distillers you know being sort of coded with disloyal people that they're kind of conflated in a lot of people's minds um yeah i, I that's a really interesting thing to have picked up on yeah i find it absolutely fascinating um, and, and, you know, you talked about masculinity, certainly as it relates to the, the disloyalty piece um, in terms of, you know, drunkenness and in the army and, and military culture, um, any, you know, other applications, because this is obviously a, a key part of what you're talking about. One of the one of the three, you know, principal words in, in your subtitle there. I wondered if you had, you know, any other angles to masculinity that you wanted to touch on in this conversation before we started uh, bringing things to a close. Um, well, so one of the things I think I think the debate then that happens um, 
I think soldiers find their own definitions of masculinity that I mentioned earlier, and then that puts them at odds really with the temperance community and at odds with kind of civilians in general. Um, so you almost get this, this national definition that's very uncomfortable with drinking. Um, and so your, your soldiers, the very people who fight to save the union somehow become less masculine because they're also more comfortable with drinking. There's a tension there. And it's not, it's not like, it's not concrete, but I, it's a tension that I pick up on. Um, but one thing we haven't really talked about is what this does at higher levels of command. Um, and so civilians in the Union and the Confederacy really worry about generals who might be drunk. Um, and this is a particular, um, particularly fascinating piece. So basically, there's concern that men who are drunk are going to blunder in battle. Um, and so you don't, obviously, you don't want your generals to be drunk. That That's common sense. Um, but what I found really interesting was the way that rumor could shape um, people's understanding of that and the way that it could work backward where known confirmed sobriety could cover up people's military blunders, um, which is, I'm not sure I explained that very clearly, but um, basically you have examples of temperance reformers who are generals like Neil Dow, um, O.O. Howard, these are both uh, union generals. And um, they're, they're very clearly sober, they're teetotalers. Um, Dow especially is not that great of a general. Um, and so you have reformers overlooking Dow's shortcomings or overlooking Howard's shortcomings at Chancellorsville, where arguably he makes a mistake um, because he's sober. And so it, it had to be other people's mistakes because this man is moral and upright um, and is sober, so it could not have been him. And then in the Confederacy, you've got Lee and Jackson, who are these kind of perfectly sober, right? They're poster boys for for teetotal, so teetotaling sober masculinity, and you can make their battle narrative fit that, right? Um, um, so that that works really well. And then you've got, I mean, Hooker, Jubal Early these men who blunder, their character is kind of questionable anyway. And so those rumors of drunkenness um, get folded into the mistakes in battle um, in, a, in the kind of the public debate about the men and their skills. Yeah, it's interesting oh. how the drunkenness or, or lack thereof is, uh, you know, it's like the conversation we were just having about loyalty. I mean, in this case, we're talking about skill and generalship, but it's the, like, it's in neither case, is it really about the drunkenness, but the, the drunkenness or lack thereof is sort of like a, another thing that we can conflate with right. something that we want. It's, it's almost like confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah. The clue that you need to show you if someone is doing their job right or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, this person is of questionable moral, moral character. Uh, I'm sure they were probably drunk. Um, right. Or, you know, this person did a bad job, but, you know, they were sober, so it can't have been, can't, can't have been their fault. Or, yeah, so that's, that's, that's fascinating right. that people are sort of, you know, angling along those lines. Yeah. Uh, well, as we kind of come towards the, the end of our, our time here, I, I wanted to, I, I like to ask this of all authors, um, because putting, you know, a book out, of, out there into the world is, you know, our gargantuan um, task. I have immense respect for anyone who uh, has the fortitude um, to, to do that. And, um, you know, now it's, it's out of your hands. It's, it's in the world. People are, are reading it and such. Um, so, uh, What's your hope for someone that picks up a copy of this book, a uh, copy of your book? And, and, you know, what do you, yeah, what, what's your hope for the book? I think I have multiple ones. Uh, first of all, I hope it's interesting. Um, and I hope it's interesting not just to, you know, people kind of up to their ears in Civil War historiography, but I hope it's it's interesting and accessible um, just as a book. Um, I also think maybe my hope is that the book tells us something about ourselves in the 21st century? Um, I think that question, and I, I'm gonna be a, 
a little bit silly here, but not really. That question of like, how much can I drink and still be a good person? Um, maybe it's my Baptist family, but I feel like that's a question that Americans still struggle with individually and as communities. Um, and I think it's a I think it's a really interesting question, and I think our relationship with drinking and substances are still kind of rooted in this tension um, between teetotalism and, and immorality and those sorts of things. So I find those questions really interesting, and I still think that we struggle with them. Um, I see a lot of echoes of my study in current debates about marijuana. Like, do we legalize it? Do we legalize it for recreation or just for medicine? You know, it's, and, and this is, is, so how much pot can I smoke and still be a good person? Well, as much as you want, as long as it's medicinal, right? And this is the same argument that Civil War soldiers are making. It's like, I'm, of course I'm drunk. I need it for my health. Um, And I, so I, I, and I don't know if that's a hope or it's just like, I hope people like draw connections and I hope there are takeaways for it not just about the war, but the way we think about ourselves and the relationship between ourselves and um, what we're eating and what we're drinking. Yeah, I, I think that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. And you're absolutely correct. It's certainly a very live question um, yeah. a, across, you know, all sorts of, you know, political debates, personal debates uh, within families, between friends. Uh, I mean, it's uh, probably a, a question that probably will never go away just because of right. the nature of the question. So in many ways, you've right. written a, a timeless book uh, <laughs> from, from that perspective. So um, that's good. And, and so I, I, I love that that reflection there. And I, I think it's always fun to ask sort of authors what, what their hope is, because, um, you know, obviously in discussing the content of a book, you know, especially history books, you know, that, that's going to be the majority of any conversation. But, you know, I feel like rarely do we get sort of the author's kind of personal take mm -hmm. on sort of what, what a book means to them, especially uh, a first book. You know, I, I've heard it said that, you know, a first book, um, you know, you have your whole life to write your first book, and then you only have, you know, two two years or something to write your <laughs> second book. Um, so, you know, there, there's something that's always innately personal, whether we're aware of yeah. it or not, I think about a first book that comes out. So yeah. um, anyway, I, I, I love that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing, sure. uh, sharing that. Um, well, this has been a blast. Um, I, if the conversation was as as engaging as I I, I, I hoped it would be, and I think uh, based on the some of the questions we got, I think our audience might agree with us. Um, so thank you so much, Megan, for for joining us today. You're very welcome. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it Good. was really great. Yeah, it's uh, this this job is is always a blast. <laughs> Get to talk with uh, interesting people about interesting things. Um, so thank you all to, for tuning in. Be sure to uh, follow us wherever you get your social medias and be sure and like and share this video. Uh, and then if you want to take your support to the next level, uh, there's a link in the comments to become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. We're a private nonprofit and memberships are a big way uh, to help us support doing what we do for as low as $25 a year. Um, so if uh, you have a chance to become a member, you've enjoyed this or any of our videos, uh, we'd certainly really appreciate it. So uh, I think next week, next Friday, I'm going to be on here again uh, in a recorded program with Dr. Ashley Lusky talking about uh, Gettysburg's uh, farmers, the civilian impact of the Battle of Gettysburg, and that promises to be a good conversation. I think that's airing on Black Friday. So uh, when you're worn out from shopping, uh, come back home and, and fire that one up. It uh, should be a, an engaging conversation. So thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll catch you all next time. Mm -hmm.